Well, my name is Benjamin Soon. I work with Flive Energy and uh, I serve primarily as its chief business development officer. But other times I've called upon to be a scientist and an engineer at the same time. Um, I was uh, previously in uh, the Air Force. Uh, I served as an analyst uh, in a role I guess they wouldn't be very happy if I, say, uh, if I mentioned. So I won't. Uh, but what happened was I got to know about thorium and specifically about uh, liquid fluoride thorium reactors uh, over the course of uh, my career over there when I was examining uh, things like uh, energy security, you know, like uh, geopol uh, geopolitics and, 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 the, uh, and the politics of energy. So I spent, I came across this technology and I thought, oh, well, this is black magic. <laughs> How can something so good not have been our primary energy source like yesterday? So I spent, um, I spent about two years teaching myself nuclear physics and chemistry and uh, not a little bit of uh, uh, nuclear history and politics as well. And uh, lo and behold, it was real. I, I, I figured that, wow, wow, there is really no reason why it shouldn't, it shouldn't be done. And so uh, I was given the opportunity uh, eventually to uh, work with uh, Kirk Sorensen, who is my boss, and uh, with Live Energy. And uh, six years later, here we are. The importance of thorium energy. I said that energy is the master commodity. Nothing is done or made without energy. We fight over energy. Therefore, it, goes, it stands to reason that if we can solve the energy problem, we basically solve world peace. And I'm not even a Miss Universe contestant. And uh, thorium represents a virtually limitless source of energy. If we can harness this source of energy, energy we, it is tantamount to solving the problem of energy and tantamount to solving, well, not world peace, but at least a a significant section of the things we could potentially come into conflict over. Well, Flive Energy was founded by Kirk Sorensen. And, uh, well, to those people who don't know Kirk Sorensen, I, I, I mean, I call him the father of the Thorium Revival. He was the man who rediscovered, I wouldn't say rediscovered, or rather he dis rediscovered and brought forward uh, molten salt reactors and the work with thorium as a nuclear fuel back in the Manhattan era. And he, like everybody else who has come into contact with this technology, had their epiphany moment when they realized that, why in the world have we not done this? He spent many years trying to lobby Congress in the US and uh, get people to pay attention. And uh, when things were moving as quickly as he desired, he uh, quit his job and started the company. And uh, I, I went with him. Okay, uh, think of it this way. Let's say you had uh, uh, the grand prize that was sitting on the table, a, a, gra a grand prize, any prize that you can think of, something you really want, and it was sitting on the table right over there. You, you need to get up and go and grab it. Whereas, and, you, and if you s see there's a second prize, which is not so good, that's right here, and you just need to reach over and get it. The point I'm trying to make is that we need to get up and get the grand prize, but it is within reach. And what makes Lifter, what, in my opinion, what makes Lifter the grand prize is that we, when you examine the, I mean, it's a very complicated field, nuclear energy, make no mistake about that, but when you examine uh, what could be the most ideal, you know, uh, the most efficient, the safest, the least waste, the, um, uh, the, the, the cheap, uh, rather the most cost, if, uh, cost efficient or potentially cheapest way, uh, way to, uh, to utilize the resource, you very quickly find that the lifter s sits at the very end of the table. And uh, it does all of those things because it, uh, it dis uh, it, the design choices that it makes is, design, uh, is basically aimed at achieving the maximum possible benefit of any, uh, of any practical return we can get using thorium as a fuel. A lifter is, well, a lifter, <laughs> oh my goodness, a lifter is a liquid fuel 
molten salt, not your table salt, uh, as, a fluor as a fluoride salt, uh, thorium fuel nuclear reactor. And what this means is that it's a nuclear reactor that is completely different from everything we've ever known. If you go and look at the nuclear textbooks and you ask any PhD in reactor engineering, there's a chance he might not really know what it is. Uh, because all this while we have been using solid fuels for nuclear reactors, and this is a legacy of the Cold War, and there are good reasons why we made these choices. They may not have been such stellar choices, but we made them nonetheless. And a lifter uses a liquid fuel system instead, which was originally developed at the same time. Now, think of it this way. Uh, the, for when you have a car and you run out of gas, what do you do? You fill it with more gas. But when, if you have a rocket, you have a single tube of, of fuel, and you need to burn it all the way to the end. You can do nothing about, uh, about you know, uh, refueling it. You have to do all kinds of complicated things to fabricate the fuel. So the fuel in the lifter is very, very easy. It's almost as easy as fill her up and go. And um, it uses thorium as that fuel, and it's able to extract over 90% of the latent energy of that fuel. Now, I like to make a comparison. Current nuclear technologies extract half of 1% of its fuel energy. That's, that's, that's 0 0.5. And a lifter produ uh, extracts 90% of its fuel. Can you see where the spectrum of efficiency lies right there? So I I'm trying to describe the differences because I don't know how else I can describe what a lifter is to a li uh, in, in, in easier to understand terms. Not just, not just efficiency, a uh, lifter has one very unique characteristic that sets it apart really from the rest of the fuel. Because of its extreme efficiency and because of the thorium fuel cycle, and we're talking about a multiplicative e effect here, you, don't, you can get one without the other, but if you put them both together, the sum of the, uh, the, the, you get greater than the sum of, uh, of the total. And the uh, lifters produce very, 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 very little waste. Uh, for example, if you to get one gigawatt of power, now just, just use one gigawatt of power as a reference, you need one ton of thorium. You need 250 tons of raw uranium to produce exactly that same amount of energy. And you know what you put in is what you're going to get out. So you put in 250 tons of raw material, you're going to get 250 tons of waste. Uh, 230 tons of uh, depleted uranium, and 30 tons of irradiated spent fuel. That's the nasty stuff that people really don't like. With a lifter, you've burnt 90% of that fuel, or 90 plus percent of the fuel. What you get is one ton of thorium in and one ton of waste out. But here's the, uh, here's the kicker. Because thorium uses a liquid fuel system, you can, uh, you can get 83% of that waste, which is actually commercially valuable products. Uh, we're talking about medical radioisotopes, life-saving stuff, space fuel, stuff that NASA is, is really hungry for because they've run out of the stuff to fuel their probes. And the remainder, 17%, which is 0 0.17 tons, is real waste. So in, in good effect, what you have done is you have turned 30 tons of high-level waste, which you need to store for over 10,000 years, or maybe millions, and now you have a reactor that produced 0.17 tons for exactly the same amount of energy. Plus, this 1.17 uh, tons of waste are much shorter lived. You can store them for 300 years. They become inert. So I, I, I describe to people, if we ha even if we had 1,000 lifters and we produced 0.17 times 1,000 every year, it's not a, it's not a whole bunch of space. A where, uh, 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 a good sized room would contain all of that waste. And then you have deep repositories, you put it there, and you, by the time your repository is about to fill up, you can take out the stuff which you put in 300 years ago and throw it out in the ocean because it's no longer, it's no longer radioactive. So you're never going to run out of repository sta uh, space because one, you produce so little of this stuff. Two, it decays away in a short enough amount of time that you, you don't need an infinite amount of space to store this. I was told by a, a mentor who I truly respect 
and I still and I always always respect. He told me that if you are going to dream, make sure your dreams are big. And I think uh, Flybe's uh, dreams are very big. We intend to power the world with uh, with lifters. We intend we intend that uh, that uh, eventually every country will have a, a, a thorium economy based around a lifter, uh, lifters that would generate all of their electricity need. We would create a, a thorium economy in which electricity is the byproduct. And we make money off of all the other stuff we can sell. And some of this stuff is pretty valuable, I can tell you that. We make a lot of money off of them. So we have that business model. I can't say more than that. But that is the dream. The dream is to solve the energy problem of the world. We think that we can do this by powering the world with thorium used in lifters. I think the first and most uh, important obstacle we need to overcome is ignorance. Um, I have a lot of colleagues and a lot of uh, personal experience in this field in which it is really very sad that people do not understand that the field of nuclear energy is really, really way more than what, what, what they see. Uh, I mean, if I say the word nuclear, which is a dirty word to a lot of people, to someone, they immediately think of Fuku Fukushima. And I don't even need to start to try to explain to them that actually Fukushima was a rather safe reactor. They got a, an event tossed at them was like, was like statistically insignificant. One in a thousand years, 10,000 years? Bad luck. But the point here being is that because they have this very narrow view of nuclear energy, they don't realize what, their op what the options are. And so they, they, they end up uh, restricting themselves to looking at options which may not have the same potential as thorium energy, thorium nuclear energy. So that's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is ignorance. Uh, and we need to overcome that by increasing awareness uh, among the general public, among decision makers, policy makers, politicians, and even engineers uh, about the fact that there is this option the, the, M, uh, the thorium MSR running on the pure thorium fuel cycle. W once, uh, once they know that, and uh, once they've done their own homework, they've gone and read, well, okay, again, you know, we're not very sure how many people really, really do that, but we, we have faith in the human race. So they will realize very quickly that here sits a solution to all of our problems. And... Uh, Leading, uh, leading off uh, from, uh, from the problem of awareness really is uh, the regulatory environment. Because uh, we, we actually have inherited a very unique legacy. The, hearts, the hard part, the, and I mean the really hard part, the science, the physics, the discoveries such as uranium-233, its properties, the compatibility of the materials, does this concept even work? These were all solved by... By men, by men in our past. It, uh, we're talking about the biggest names in history here. We're talking about Enrico F uh, Fermi, Glenn Seberg, uh, Alvin, Weinberg, uh, Alvin Weinberg, Eugene Wigner. If, if you recognize none of them, just Google. It'll come up on the first, uh, on the first hit. These men, uh, these men solved the hardest problem for us already. And what's left for us is really to come to the place where we understand and we can create the regulatory uh, environment to enable the... Uh, deployment of this technology. Uh, I like to. Uh, I, I mean, I like the story of Edison and uh, J.P. Morgan. A lot of people don't realize. I mean, I, I mean, many people. We all respect uh, Thomas Edison. He was a brilliant man, a genius. We owe it to him a lot of our modern life. Uh, we owe it to him. The part that people don't really realize is that. Edison could never have done the things he did if it weren't for J.P. Morgan. And, what was J and what's J.P. Morgan's part in this? Money. It's really, really about money. And um, for us, we find that uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, building on from the awareness problem is that investors and uh, governments who would invest in the technology 
they generally don't understand the technology, lack of awareness. And because of that, nobody's really willing to put money forward. And everybody's waiting for somebody else to go first. And really, uh, we've already presented the arguments on the table. It really makes very great sense. And we even have a fully commercial development strategy built on this so that you don't even need to wait 20 years to get your money back. You can get it back in five years. And yet, at the same time, there is still this resistance to opening their wallets. So I think, really, the story, we learn a lot from the story of JP Morgan and Edison. And that's one of the things that uh, we really would like to see some, uh, some, help, some help with. And uh, your question about can Fly Energy do this alone? Of course not. We're only a one company. Kirk's one man, and so am I. Um, we, need, we need to build an international consortium, uh, an international community of not just scientists and engineers, but business people, leaders, the thought leaders, the decision makers. They all have to be on board. They all have to see that we have a problem. Because if we don't have a problem, everyone can pack up and go home. Okay? Uh, we can close shop. I'll go back and fly, uh, fly helicopters or uh, aircraft. We need that. We, uh, uh, Flyve Energy cannot, uh, cannot achieve this alone. We can make the technology work. We can, we can yell at the top of our lungs at, at our political leaders to, uh, to pay attention to us. But unless, of course, we have support, financial support, political support, and international support, it's going to be very difficult for us to get everything done alone. Well suited? Yes. Ready? I'm not so sure. Um, I come from Singapore, and uh, I love my country. Uh, and Singapore is very, very well suited for Lifter. Very well suited. I'll cover that first. It is a small country, which is about, you know, let me see. It's about uh, four times the size of Manhattan. Yes, there are about five million people living on that tiny island. It's, it punches way above its weight in, in terms of being an economic powerhouse. I mean, come on, there's F1, uh, F1 Singapore, okay? Um, and it has a problem. It is, very, it is a country that is very, very, very energy dependent, as with any technologically and economically advanced society. It's got very little space. Eventually, you're going to run out of space to build more power capacity. If it were not for the fact that fossil fuels is a finite resource. And Singapore imports nearly 100% of its energy. Now, if you ask any political scientist or national security specialist, that is a very bad place to be in. All right? You are basically, your, your fate is tied up in the good graces of another person. Uh, and eventually, fossil fuels will become unviable. And what happens then to tiny little Singapore, which requires so much energy? It would, it would, it would uh, asphyxiate. And uh, that would be the end of it. However, it's not able to accept nuclear energy in the cur its current form because of population proximity. You cannot put a nuclear reactor that requires a one-mile safety radius. It, that, that, that is about a, a fifth of the country already. So they're stuck in a rock and a hard place. On one hand, they need that energy. On the other hand, they need something that's deterministically safe. Now, what do I mean by deterministically? And this is a bit of a big word here. Deterministic safety is one in which the consequences of the worst possible accident is considered and acceptable. Probabilistic safety, is, uh, which all nuclear reactors operate under today, is one in which you determine that the worst possible scenario's accident consequences is not acceptable, but that the chances of it happening is so low that it is, it is acceptable. Unfortunately, you know, Mother Nature has a way of really uh, showing up the plans of mice and men. So Fukushima was a pretty good example of that. And um, for Singapore, that's not a non-starter. If we had even 1% of a Fukushima issue, it would be the end of the country. So it is the most suitable in that it has a very, very great need for energy, but it has a need for energy that, that must be deterministically safe. The Lifter is really the only nuclear reactor that is capable of, of, uh, of uh, satisfying that need. 
Now, are they ready for it? I think no one in this world at present is ready yet for a lifter. In fact, I should go so far to say that nobody in the world is ready for an MSR yet of any kind. Simply because MSRs and well, I don't want to say the rest, but uh, liquid fuel reactors, MSRs, and solid fuel reactors, which is everything else, they are so different that expertise in one does not translate across to the other. I can be a PhD with 30 years of experience in solid fuels and have almost no relevance if I were to ask to design and, uh, and, and plan for an MSR. We have so pitifully little expertise right now that one of the big questions that, uh, that, uh, that need to be answered is uh, we need to build expertise. We need to build it now, we need to build it fast. So there, that's my opinion. If I had my way, if I had my way, we would be on the way to utility class lifters within 15 years. In fact, I will try to have my way. Uh, but, I mean, uh, we, assuming that we manage to overcome the resistance, the regulatory resistance, we manage to overcome the funding resistance. And I haven't heard this talked about because this is rather a taboo issue, you know, you don't ever want to say that there's not enough money, but there's not enough money. So, so we have to overcome this. There is no reason to believe that a pure thorium fuel cycle MSR, like the lifter, cannot be ready for deployment. I don't know about widespread commercial use, but at least deployment so that we can show that, yes, it works. Yes, it does everything we say, uh, uh, we say it does or we think it does. Yes, it will solve the energy problem. I think there is no reason to believe this could not be done within five years. If there were the political will, the money, and the, the, uh, uh, the aspirations of the engineers, the businessmen, the people who are going to make it happen. Geopolitics. There is a beast of another color. And it's one of the things that I have been very, very uh, interested in. Nuclear energy is a, a field that is to a higher standard. If you want to talk about double standards in the world, well, here is the prime example. When you deal with nuclear technology, nuclear anything, there comes this inherent fear, one, of radiation, that's A. Two, and this is probably the, uh, America, uh, America's fault, sorry America, but um, proliferation, all right? The big powers, the, the big leaders, they're all terrified that somehow or rather you're going to get this proliferation of nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not making light of this subject. I think it's really important. I'm the last person who wants to see a terrorist get his hands on some fissile material, okay? That's serious stuff. But I think uh, it's been overblown to such a point that we have uh, crippled ourselves. We have chosen, we have, we have chosen, we have had to choose between three poison chalices, and we chose to drink one part a particular one. And in this sense, we choose to sacrifice the environment, the, the, you know, uh, 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 CO2 emissions, uh, sustainable energy in, prefer uh, in preference for uh, prevention of proliferation of nuclear weapons. I'm not saying any one of them is any worse than the other. But the fact of the matter is that because they have chosen this particular pathway, they have concentrated so much on it that it has become really a crippling factor for the nuclear industry. Now, what does geopolitics have to do with this? You have to remember that unless you are a country that produces, that mines, refines, fabricates, and produces, and disposes of your own fuel, you're going to have to play nice with everyone who, whose territory your purchased fuel is going to have to pass through. And you're going to have to deal, or you're going to have to be real nice and sweet with the guy who's going to take your nuclear waste eventually. 
you're going to have to uh, give him a lot of benefits and incentives to want to take your nuclear waste. The waste issue is really the big, the, the, the big question of geopolitics. The fuel issue is also an, an, another big issue on geopolitics because now you're talking about moving uh, fissile materials in between countries. And fissile materials in international parlance is special material. Special because you can make, you could potentially make weapons with it. This is a, a rather silly, uh, okay, I wouldn't say silly, but it's a very lay person's understanding of it because if you were truly technically in it, you would realize that 5% enriched uranium is very different from 20% enriched uranium. They're both fissile fuels, but one has a much greater chance of weaponization than the other. And weapons material requires in excess of 80% enrichment. It's really difficult to do that. Okay? But you see, current international regulations and people who do not understand how fissile material work, group them all into the same thing. You can make bombs with natural uranium. Oh my goodness, the eyeballs start to roll. All right? No, you, you cannot. Yes, you can. End of story. No more discussion. All right, so, and the geopolitics really revolves around that. Um, and countries, there are no such things as permanent friends, only permanent interests. And this is from my time in the military, all right? A great man once said that, all right? Some people don't like him, but I think he's a great man. But anyway, he, uh, he elucidated this point, and I agree with it. Even if this were not truly the case, and policymakers in certain countries understood this, they would use this misconception to try to um, gain advantage for themselves in international uh, negotiations. But that's another story aside. But this is the reason why we say that geopolitics is really the big problem in, the nu uh, in nuclear development. Uh, I have tried to go around and tell people that lifters, or at least thorium fuel MSRs like the lifter, well, I can only speak for lifter because I only know the lifter design. I can't speak for anyone else. The lifters overcome one very big, pro uh, one very big hurdle in this geopolitical question. With a lifter, once you've got a starter fuel in the lifter, your plant is going and it's humming along, chugging out, uh, pumping out electricity happen happily and your citizens are happy, you never need to ever buy or move fissile fuel to it again. You only need thorium. Thorium is not fissile. It is so mildly radioactive that if someone were to come and challenge me, I would tell him that I will sleep with a block of thorium under my pillow for the rest of my life, and I will probably pass away much, much uh, uh, later than you. It is so inert that, uh, I mean, it is so weakly radioactive that it is essentially an inert material. And uh, what, do you, what, do you, what kind of protection do you need from inert material? Well, it's still a little radioactive, so all right, you know, put it in, uh, put in a slightly, put it in at least a box that, that will prevent whatever stray radioactivity if it were even detectable outside. But then you've overcome one of the big problems with geopolitics, and that is moving around fissile material constantly. Now, if we had a world filled with, let's say, traditional light water reactors, and only like five countries in the world were allowed to produce fissile fuel, guess what? You'd, every other ship would be carrying uranium-235 in it. And uranium-235, make no mistake, is, uh, is the primary bo uh, uh, bomb material. I mean, there's plutonium, but yes, you get my meaning. What do I want the world to know? I want the world to know that there is a small company in the United States that, it, that was founded with the specific goal of trying to save the world. <laughs> that they sh uh, people should make, it an, uh, make an effort to educate themselves, get in touch with uh, with people who know about the technology and be very cautious about what they read because you know again I've said before thorium is a is a is a wonderful material because it is so abundant and we can use it to make energy but thorium the pro some of the properties of thorium such as safety waste proliferation resistance these 
properties, these advantageous properties, can only be claimed when you use Thorium in a very, very specific manner and in the right machine. Not every Thorium machine, uh, uh, energy machine, if I call it that, nuclear reactor, has the say, uh, could, uh, can extract these properties of Thorium. So this is very important. Just because it uses Thorium doesn't mean it's safe. Just because it uses Thorium doesn't, mean, doesn't necessarily mean it's clean. Just because it uses thorium doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't produce a, a, a lot of high-level waste and a, a lot of it. You have to be very judicious in, uh, in this. And this is really my exhortation to people who are interested in this. Go and educate yourself. Don't let anyone tell you what to believe, not even me.